afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our CSUSB Alumni Association webinar. My name is Joanna Oxendine, Assistant Director of Alumni Affairs here at Cal State San Bernardino, and I'll be moderating today's webinar session, Resume Writing 101. Before we begin, I want to take just a moment to thank you all for your participation in today's webinar session. Before I introduce today's alumnus presenter, Dave Kedros, I want to take just a few moments to go over the logistics of our webinar platform. During his presentation, David will be sharing with you all his screen, which will feature a PowerPoint presentation. As we go along, please feel free to submit your questions to David, who will be stopping his presentation every few slides or so to check for and answer your questions. To submit a question, you can use the chat box found in the GoToWebinar dashboard, which should have appeared on your screen when you logged into today's session. Those questions that are not answered during today's live presentation will be answered via email. And at the end of the webinar, David will share his contact information with you in case you'd like to contact him uh, later on with any additional questions you might have. I'll also be sending to you an email with a PDF version of David's PowerPoint slides, so you'll have those as a resource. And we'll also post the PDF version to our CSUSB alumni website. And Technology Willing will be recording today's session to archive on our website at a later date. David Kiteros is a two-time CSUSB grad, graduating first in 2005 with a BA in Sociology and a Social Work Certificate, and then again in 2010 with an MBA. And he's remained involved as an alumnus through the CSUSB Alumni Association Hispanic Chapter as one of its founding members and actually still sits on the board today. He's currently the Administrative Manager for Human Services Personnel in San Bernardino County and previously worked as a supervising social worker in the Department of Sur Department Services Oh, I'm sorry, in the Department of Aging and Adult Services. David has worked for many years as a facilitator of workshops aimed at helping people become more employable. He's presented numerous workshops on resume writing, application completing, how to dress for an interview, and just general interviewing skills. And last November, David received his certificate from the Management and Leadership Academy of San Bernardino County. So I think David is a great resource for this webinar today, Resume Writing 101. So David, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Joanna. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for, for being here. Um, typically with PowerPoints, um, I don't go through each bullet and you know just read. Um, however, in this particular case, I'm going to read pieces, pieces of each bullet just so that everybody understands exactly where I'm at um, in the presentation um, prior to me um, elaborating. Uh, as Joanna said, I'll pause every few slides um, to answer any questions that you might have. Um, you know, hopefully they pertain to whatever we're covering, uh, but if not, you know, uh, if you have general questions or extra questions, we can also do those at the end as well. Um, so just to get started, um, I hope everyone can see the, the first slide here, um, the introduction to our Resume Writing 101. Um, here. Okay. Uh, basically today, the purpose of us being here is to um, just kind of go through some, some general things like the reason, you know, we do the purpose of a, of a resume. Um, the three main types of resumes that you know you guys should all know about when when job seeking. Um, how to how to identify you know transferable skills. That's really a skill in and of itself that people don't um, learn how to how to tap into. The best resume writers can identify a skill of their own and adapt it to um, whatever job or whatever skills are needed for that particular job. Tips for tailoring resumes. Um, again, this is uh, just stating that you know you should have one ge generic resume, which we'll get into, but then you should also be able to tailor any specific resume to any specific job application or, or interview. And then lastly, general guidelines for resume presentation. Um, and these are some things, a lot of these things for some of you may be elementary, they may be kind of common sense, 
um, but you know, still they they're worth you know um, touching on and, and reinforcing. The purpose of a resume, um, the primary goal of a resume is to spark enough interest. Um, that's really the uh, you know typically when you hand in a resume, you're handing it in in lieu of an application or as a supplemental piece of the application. But typically, you're also going to um, use it in an interview. Okay, so there are different ways to go about it, but you should always know this. You should always be ready with your resume. You should always make sure that your resume um, is accurate and speaks to you. Now, typically when you have an interview, you've already made it through the first screening process, which is the application process. A lot of times, um, you know, when you get to the interview, the, uh, the application is already going to be reviewed or, or will have already have been reviewed. And with that being said, um, when it comes to an interview, it's just basically reinforcing all the things that you're going to say in an interview. Um, with it, when it's submitted with an application or in lieu of an application, it has to do enough to spark interest and get you through that piece of the screening process. But once it's in an interview, you know, the things that you're saying in an interview have to match or, re you know, the resume has to reinforce what you're saying in an interview. Because typically they're not looking at a resume while you're interviewing, they're listening to you. Typically they look at it after. So they want to know, you know, are you saying, are the things on your resume, do they relate to what you're saying in an interview? Um, so that's always key to keep in mind. But the purpose of an interview varies, the purpose of a resume varies, excuse me, um, but typically, you just want it to be an absolute, you know, presentation or, or a, uh, something that that um, that stands for you. Something that when people look at it, they see your name, but then they see all of your skills and attributes. The three resume types we talked about: um, there's functional, and chronological, and combination, or hybrid. A lot of people say hybrid now. I guess that's the the unique word to use, but. Um, there, there are places and reasons to use each of these. Um, my favorite, personally, is a combination or hybrid. Or um, you know, and you, you don't have to stick to one one way of doing them. You can have several versions of all three if you like. Um, but again, each type has its has a re there's a reason that there are three different types, um, and then variations of those. Any questions before we move on to? you know, the different types of resumes and examples. We'll pause to give you all just a few moments to type in any questions that you might have. Okay, David, it looks like we don't have any questions at this point. All righty. Well, in a functional resume, um, the first one we're going to go over is obviously a functional resume, and the the um, emphasis here is are, are basically the skills and the strengths that uh, that you possess. Um, again, the second bullet says it's often used when changing careers or when there are large gaps of employment or when you don't have a lot of work history. And we run into this a lot, um, you know, with Cal State graduates or soon to be graduates, um, you know, looking for work in a particular field. Many of you may have done internships or, or different things to get some experience, but you don't actually have that paid um, work history that a lot of employers are looking for. Uh, so typically you're going to be applying for entry level positions, but a functional resume is really just to um, emphasize what you bring to the table. Okay, It's going to emphasize what you feel you can do, um, the, the different skills that you've attained in your studies, um, in your internships, in your volunteer work, and whatever it is that you've done, um, this is basically where you're going to draw it out. You're going to emphasize that those, those as it says here, personal achievements um, and, and skills that you have. See how work history is, is sort, of, sort of towards the bottom? Um, because you probably don't have that work history, you're not going to emphasize that in your resume. The, the meat of the resume should always be, you know, towards the top, you know, back down to the middle and towards the bottom. What I mean by that is when you look at a piece of paper or a resume, the bulk of what you're trying to say should be in the middle, you know, upper 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 portion to the to the like lower portion of the resume. Kind of like you see here um, where it says personal achievements and skills. 
That's what I mean. That whole portion right there is really the body of the resume. Everything else is, is important but kind of secondary, and that's what you want to focus on. Now, um, this is just a type of resume, but I did want to touch on the objective. Some people, um, some people like to put an objective in. Some people don't like to put an objective. An objective, um, I always use it in any resume that I have. It's just because it's, it's really kind of standard. It's really kind of traditional. Um, and you know, most traditional things when it comes to job searching still hold up. Now, one thing to remember, when you put your objective, if you can tailor that objective to the job that you're going for, the better off you are. And what I mean by that is if you're going, you don't want to just have an, a one sentence. An objective should always be like one sentence anyway, by the way. Uh, maybe two at the most, but it shouldn't take up a whole lot of room. And it should be something like, you know, um, to obtain a position in, let's say you're doing social work. To obtain a social work position um, in a field where I can utilize my skills with, you know, working with children, working with elder adults, something, something to that nature. It should be like that. It should be descriptive but not overboard. Um, furthermore, if you know there's a particular job that you want to get into, you should tailor it to that job. For instance, if you're going for a position at Cal State San Bernardino and the position is, um, I don't know, assistant director or um, something like that, you should, meet, you should basically you know, tailor that to say my objective is to attain you know, an associate director or an assistant director's position with Cal State you know, with California State University San Bernardino in which I can utilize my A, B, and C skills. Something to that effect. Okay, I hope everyone kind of kind of gets where I'm going with that. Secondly, personal achie professional achievements, skills that kind of run together, um, and then work history, education speaks for itself, and references. Okay, I don't believe that you should ever put references on the face of a resume. However, you should always have references available. References here, they basically say, it basically instead of listing the references, it says ref references are available on request or upon request. You should put that at the very end of your resume. And not only that, when you put that, you should have those references available. You should have a minimum of three, um, but you know, at least five. I, I, would, I would say at least three, typically five. Um, and you should have those ready on the same type of paper that you have your resume on, they should be uniformed, they should be ready to go. I wouldn't give them with them initially unless they ask for them you know, up front, but you should always have those ready. Okay, chronological. Um, this is for people who, who you typically have a strong work history in a particular field and they want to, they really want to emphasize their work history. Um, if, in other words, as you can see here, um, in the body of the resume, experience is the key here. Um, not so much attributes or skills or different things that they can do, it's things that they've done, okay, that people have done. And you'll find this typically in, in, in non-entry level positions, in positions in which salary is um, negotiable. Um, you'll see this a lot, you know, when it comes to that when you have a strong work history. And um, it's basically self-explanatory. You're going to put the job position, um, the company name and the dates of employment, and then you're just going to go into each each skill or each um, assignment or thing that you did while you were at that position, um, because it has to obviously it has to relate to the position that you're going for, though. So if you don't have a strong work history, chronological is probably not the resume for you, because you don't want to highlight, you know, the positions that you've held previously that relate to the new position. Um, but again, if you have this type of um, work history, it's called chronological because of the order. Um, if you have this work history, obviously you want to start um, with the most recent and, and uh, you know, go, go down that way and go first, you know, newest to oldest, top to bottom. Um, and like I said, it, it's usually going to be the last bullet says most useful when looking for positions in a similar, similar line of work. That's true. Um, so you know you really want to, or or if if the things that you've done, if it's not a similar line of work, um, if the things that you've done, if you can figure out a way to relate them to the to the upcoming position, this is the type of resume you want to have. And again, this typically lends to a strong you know work history or lengthy work history. Okay. 
last one we're going to go over before I take some questions is a combination resume and or a hybrid. Um, this is really my favorite because um, you can kind of play with it. What you see here isn't isn't absolute. These resumes that you're seeing, they don't have to go in the order that you see them. They don't have to look like this. They don't have to be anything like this. But I really want to just focus you on the on the headings or the subheadings, I should say. Um, it's basically it, it combines. It can combine, I should say. It doesn't always, but it can combine work history along with the skills and attributes that you may have or that you may want to offer to an employer. Um, this is my favorite because you you really can um, you can focus on either you can you can play around with the employment you can play around with you know skills and when I say employment that also equals experience but um, you can focus primarily the focus here is you, as you can still as you can see skills are on top and those are skills that really should lend again to the job that you're going for okay and this could be for a for an entry level position, or it can be for a for you know for a position that that you know requires experience. Either way, the focus is this: you should always be be using skills and and emphasizing skills and attributes that you have or that you can offer to an employer that match what the employer wants. And we'll kind of talk about how to um, you know do that and how to figure that out. But essentially. As the bottom bullet says, this highlights your skills and experience first, then let's work history. And work history, you know, um, you know, you can you can even list skills and then education and then work history if you don't have a lot of work history. You know, you can you can play around with this resume. That's it's so flexible that um, you can really emphasize anything that you like. Um, so that's why I enjoy this one. You know, you don't have to list every employer that you that you ever had. You can just put the ones that are that are applicable. Um, or you can just, uh, you know, focus more mostly on skills. In other words, you could have your objective and then have skills um, next, and then do you know seven, eight, you know, ten bullet points or different types of bullets that that show that talk about your experience or the skills that you've attained in previous jobs. For instance, um, able to work under pressure, um, you know. Was able to you know handle multi-line phones um, at over 100 100 calls per day, something like that that would lend to what your edu what your experience or your you know employment history is going to show later on in the resume. But you're highlighting what you can actually do for the employer rather than highlighting the the time you spent in a in a position. And again, um, these skills and attributes should be emphasized or should be. Um, in line again with what what the employer wants, so what they're seeking for that position. We'll stop and take any questions now. And we do have a few coming in. Okay. Um, so, with the types of resumes, David, which type of resume do most employers prefer? I don't think there's necessarily one type of resume. I think again, it, it really depends on. It really depends on the position. If it's an entry level position, um, I don't want to. Obviously, I'm not going to. I'm not going to need to see your work experience necessarily. Um, you know, it may help if you have a lot of good work experience. However, most entry level jobs don't require a ton of experience, so I'm not necessarily worried about your experience. I'm more worried about what you can offer me in this position. I more want to know. More so, want to know what you can offer or what you can bring to this position, um, you know, as an entry-level person in my company. In other words, what skills do you have that you can bring to this position other than work history? You know what I'm saying? So it really depends on the position. Now, if it's a position that requires 10 years of accountant experience, for instance, let's say it's an accountant two or three position with the San Bernardino County, an employer is going to want to see a chronological type of resume or a combination resume that really speaks towards the work history that you have. I want to know that you're competent enough. If I'm going to pay you, you know, ninety thousand a year, and trust you with, you know, the businesses or the counties or whomever's money, you know, and and the numbers for you to for you to work the numbers, I want to know that you've done this job. So, with that, I need to know that you're 
in a position like that or you had a position that was comparable to it, that way I'm, I'm more comfortable, you know, offering you position. Um, and again, it's got to be in line with what, whatever you do in your, with your application and in your interview. So um, the answer is there's no, there's no one resume to go with. What you need to focus on is what do you have to offer. Everyone, everyone that's listening to this and everybody, period, that's job seeking has to really ask themselves, what do I have to offer? If I were an employer, okay, if every person in, you know, listening right now was an employer and they own their own business, who would you hire? What type of people would you hire? What type of people would you trust with your livelihood? If, if your small business was your baby and you had a family at home and you had to feed that family and every customer and every, everything that you did inside that small business, you know, depended, you know, was, was a direct reflection of your livelihood, who would you hire? What would you, what would you want? If you needed an accountant to be, you know, someone that, that you could leave in charge and that you, you know, that you could trust, you know you're going to want somebody that, that has some, you know, a decent amount of experience. So what do you want to see in an interview? What do you want to see in a resume? Same, same could be said if you have an entry-level position. What type of person do you want for an entry-level position or an intern position or a position in which, you know, doesn't require a lot of work history but can learn on the job? What do you want? I want someone enthusiastic. I want someone that, you know, is going to outwork the next person. And how do I know that? You know, you have to be consistent. A resume is basically a, a consistent piece of your puzzle. It starts with your application. It starts with your appearance. It starts with how you, how you present yourself. It starts... It, it goes to the interview, and it, and, it, and it resides in the resume. Everything has to fit together. If one of those things contradicts the other, you know, I start to see red flags, and I'm not as comfortable offering new position if the next person, and believe me, there are tons of them, if the next person is consistent and has just as much experience or just as much to offer as you. So again, you really have to ask yourself, what is it that, that you would hire? Who, who would you hire? Are you going to hire the person, you know, and... And I won't say that, that work experience is more important or energy is more important or, you know, willingness to do the job. It's not necessarily about that. What it is about is that do I feel comfortable making this decision? And you guys that are listening, you guys have to make that determination. What is going to be your best attribute that you can offer an employer? And whatever it is, stick with that, go with that. And don't, don't make that it. You know, don't make that the only thing. You can have work history and experience and be energetic in an interview and be, you know, and, and have a good attitude and, and be enthusiastic. Same way, you can, it doesn't necessarily mean if you don't have a huge job history that you have to be bouncing off the walls in an interview, you know, and, and to show that you're enthusiastic. You don't have to do that. But what, what is it about you that makes you better than the next person? Every person listening has to figure that out before they begin a job search. Because if you, if you can't sell yourself, if you don't know what it is about you that makes you better than the next person, how are you going to sell that to somebody else? So, sorry, that was kind of a long-winded answer, but I, I hope I hope I answered that question. And there are quite a few more questions rolling in for you, David. So we'll try to take these as best we can. Um, okay. As someone who hires, you are someone in the position to hire people. Has an ob a objective statement ever helped you? as an employer, choose one candidate over another candidate for a position? I won't say that it has helped me uh, choose someone over the other. I will say that it's helped me disqualify someone over another. And what I mean by that is that a resume has to be, it has to be golden. It has to be 100% right on. And I've seen, I've seen resumes where I receive them, and you can tell it was kind of a can. It, it was used from another resume. Um, the wording is, there's, there's mis, misspelled words, um, believe it or not, or they're, they're talking about a completely different position than the one I'm offering, or the skills that they put in there, you know, that they, when they name a couple skills that they have, they don't even match up to, to the job that, that I'm going for. So what it is, it's basically... You know, 90% of what we do in an interview and everything else is not to, it's not to to qualify us for the job. You're already qualified. That's why you're there. Employers are, believe it or not, are looking for reasons to disqualify you because there's so many applicants. 
So if you disqualify yourself, it makes my job easier. So really, it's all kind of that consistency, that attention to detail, that that way of going about your business that shows me that you're you're doing the things that you need to do or that you know to show me that you really want to do this. You know, if you can't pay attention to to what your objective says um, or your spelling on a resume, then you know that's your that speaks to your attention to detail, and I don't want you. So the answer is no. Um, but it has helped me eliminate people, yes. What should you do in the case where you don't have professional experience in the field that you're applying to, um, but you do have part-time jobs, like waitressing or retail? Do you think it's important to mention those positions, or do they just categorize you as being somebody who can only do customer service? You. Not necessarily. You have to you have to think outside of the box when you're taking your experience. And I can you know, every single job that you do. I don't care. I don't care what it is. Uh, you can't name me a job in the world that doesn't that doesn't require some type of customer service. Um, because we're not just talking about external customers. You're also talking about internal customers. The people that for the county that sit in a room all day and crunch numbers and do all that crazy stuff that I can't do, um, they answer to somebody. And believe it or not, they their job is to is to make someone else's job easier, and that's what they do. And those are their customers, you know. And what I'm trying to get at is that customer service is is really a part of everything. And what what your challenge is, or the challenge that's presented to you, is not having a ton of work experience is to pull those things out that you've done, okay, in the, in the jobs that you've had. Pull those characteristics and those things, those outside the box types of things that, that can relate to the job that you're going for and focus on the skills. Okay, don't focus on the work history. Don't focus on, you know, kind of kind of like a functional resume. Focus on the skills that you've attained and don't worry about about um, the work history. Pull out the skills. Like if you if you've worked customer service your entire life, you know, at say a restaurant, and you've been a waitress or a waiter, and you've been there for five years, six years, whatever, and you're going for, you know, um, just to just to think outside the box, a social worker position. You know, there are so many things that you did, you know, as a as a waiter or waitress that can lend to social work. You know, time management. You know, time management as a social worker is essential. Um, you know, uh, efficiency. As a waiter or waitress, you have to be very efficient and think on your feet. You have to be, you know, able to act suddenly in the field as a social worker. So, so, you, so you lend that. You, you, you pull out that skill from what you've done in the past, and you focus on that in your resume. You don't, you don't worry about it. You're not, gonna, you're not here to apologize for the experience that you don't have. You're here to present the skills that you do have that lend to the job. And every, you know, in every, basically every job, you can find skills that apply this new job. Some of them are a stretch, but that's okay. You you know you have to sometimes stretch it out a little bit, but you have to be able to back up that whatever you're saying. So as long as you can back that up, it's okay to stretch it a little bit. The point is, you're going out of your way to pull out those transferable skills and relate them to the job. So um, you know you just got that's your challenge. You have to pull out those skills and focus on your skills. Don't focus on your work history and don't apologize for your work history. Instead, emphasize what you can do for that employer. You know, don't tell me what you can't do. Tell me what you can do. Great. Um, we have a person who is applying for an internship that highlights um, study abroad. Would something like that, study abroad, would that fall under your education category or under achievements if you've been involved in a study abroad program? Um, you could do it either way, um, as long as it's as long as it's on there and it's really. If you're going to do it under education, um, you know you should probably separate it a little bit, might be by extra space, just so that it stands out a little bit. Um, you do want to be consistent on a on a resume, but you know certain things you do need to stick out, and something like that 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 um, that the person really wants to emphasize. You can make a different subheading. Um, you know, you can. It doesn't have to say personal achievements. It could say um, extracurricular activities or activities or 
um, you know, accomplishments or what, you know, whatever, whatever you wanted to say, um, you can do that. And if you really, if you really feel strongly that that is really going to, going to help you in your job seeking, um, then you should definitely emphasize that. And you can lump it in with the, with the education, but you definitely want, don't want to make it just another line on your resume. You want to make it stick out however you can, and even putting a different subheading. These aren't the only subheadings that you can use in a resume. You can call it whatever you like. You don't want to get too crazy, but you, you don't want to call. You can call it whatever you like, um, and you can have one thing under a subheading. You know, if it's that important and, it's, and it relates to the job that much, you can definitely go that route. Uh, but you should definitely make sure it's on there. Um, so the answer is you can use either. You can make a different subheading or put it under education. But if you put it under education, emphasize it. Great. Um, how would you deal with listing a series of promotions within the same company? Um, are they separate jobs, or how do you how do you deal with that? Mm, that's a good question. Um, if you're going to do it sort of like a chronological um, way, you're going to put um, you can use um, slashes. Like if you're going to put the job title. You can put the multiple job titles that you that you had or the multiple positions that you had. Started with the highest one first. You know, if you were a supervisor slash um, you know uh, customer service rep slash intern, something like that. You can do that all in one. But that that typical typically that um, that set of bullets is going to be larger than the rest of the uh, of the the jobs that you held because you obviously spend more time there and you obviously did more there that matters to the job that you're going for or that relates to the job that you're going for. So you don't have to necessarily separate them out. Um, if it's the same company which you held different positions at, you know, and you have other ones that you want to also reference, you can use slashes, um, you know, to separate those positions and they'll get the hint um, and they'll see the to and from. but. You know, and somewhere in your bullets, you can actually put in there. You know, um, was able to promote to you know from customer service to supervisor, or something of that sort. You can put that inside your bullets if you really want to. Um, but I think they'll get the hint if they see that you you were there for several years and that you held different positions. They're going to assume that you promoted within. And um, if now, if you don't have a ton of other work experience, you can list those out. You know, you could. You can make one job title, you know, supervisor, and the dates you've been a supervisor, the same company name. Put your bullets as a supervisor, bam, and then go to the next one. Customer service rep, same, you know, dates of employment, same company name, and then put the things that you did as a customer service rep, and, and so on, you know, if you don't have a lot of work history. So it's really a matter of, of what you got. I'm a firm, firm, firm believer that a resume should be one page um, simply because, um, Employers just don't have time to get into it if it's longer than one page. Uh, I wish it weren't like that, but that's really what it is. So, how are you going to maximize your space? That's really what it comes down to. Now, you can use, you can do two pages, you can do five pages if you really feel comfortable with it. But the fact of the matter is, most employers just want to basically one page. They don't, they don't have time to go through two, three, four pages anymore. They just don't, um, because there's so many things, you know, so many employees. In, so many applicants and so many things going on. What should what should you do for gaps in employment? Um, again, you really want to probably do a, some type of functional or combination resume where where the gaps aren't highlighted. What's highlighted again are your skills, the transferable skills, the skills that you learned in these positions that relate to your newest job. Um, you, don't have to, you don't have to emphasize the fact that you didn't work you know, for five years here or six years, you know, ten years here, whatever it is. You don't have to highlight that fact. You can focus on all the things that you can do, all the things that you bring to the table, and then under employment or work history, that's where you just list it. You know, as you can see right here where everybody's at in the slideshow, as you can see right here, this work history, it's very vague. You know, it's job title, company name, you know, location and dates of employment. And it's at the bottom, you know, and, and they're stacked together in, in relative succession. So you, you know, you, if you held, you know, five, six different jobs, but there were breaks in between, you know, 
it doesn't necessarily matter with this type of resume. Um, again, you're not going to apologize for those breaks in your employment. What you're going to do is you're going to emphasize what you can bring to the table. So you, you do need, though, I will say this, you do need to be able to explain those, those breaks in employment if it comes up. Because believe me, oftentimes it does come up. So you really need to be able to explain the gaps in employment. Because you know whether it was raising a family, going back to school, whatever it was, you really should have some type of legitimate reason that you can, you know, not just I decided I wanted to go back and live with mom and dad. It's, I mean, that's not going to work. You have to be able to explain that. Okay, I think we'll do one more question right now, David, and then let you go on, and maybe that'll answer some more of the outstanding questions. But um, what parts of of old-fashioned resumes, if you will, now harm people instead of helping an applicant? And would you recommend not including in a resume today? Um, I, I don't want to say that anything necessarily hurts um, anyone, because this is all stuff that, you, that should be somewhere, that, that you should have presented somewhere already. In other words, the information on your resume, again, you can't put all the skills that you have on an application. And sometimes you forget about certain skills to mention in an interview. So this is, again, this is something that if, you, if you're honest and you're forthcoming and you really take the time to, to talk more than anything about your skills, okay, and, you, and you're honest about your education, you're honest about your work history, you're honest about, you know, you're direct about your objective, if you do all those things, you know, in your personal achievements, you're honest about that. If you do all those things, then there's really nothing that can hurt you on the resume. In my opinion, one of the things, the things that that hurt people the most are just, you know, just not paying attention. You know, lacking the common sense that it takes to, you know, have four or five people proofread it. You know, have five, have four or five people in that field, or you know, that that work in that field, or that like me that you know that review app resumes and applications have four or five people look at it and take you know to give it to them take a uh, take direction from them take suggestion from them and that doesn't mean you have to do it but if you really want you know good feedback and you really want a, a particular job you should get with people in the field and you should do your research do your homework pay attention to detail write several resumes and really get into it because i won't say it's one or two things that 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 um disqualify people or something, you know, that, that from a traditional resume that disqualifies a person. Um, it's really just not paying attention, not speaking to the job, and, you know, just showing me that you really just didn't care. You know, you really didn't put forth the effort that it takes that I want to see if I'm going to trust you, you know, with my company, with my business. And I just want to piggyback, David, because you just opened up a, a wonderful door for me to do so. I was going to say so at the end, but since you just opened that door, I'm going to walk right on through it. Um, it's also important to keep in mind that there are resources available to you as a student and as an alum here on campus through the Career Center. Um, there are counselors here on campus who are more than happy to review resumes, and they also bring in employers to do the same um, and send out messages. So if you're not signed up on Coyote League, um, make sure that you do so, so that you're aware of when employers are on campus and will be holding resume critiquing sessions, or talk to one of the career counselors and ask them to critique your resume as well. They're a great resource and underutilized. Yeah, I totally agree. And the the software um, that is available um, to write a resume, or create a resume, or um, to tweak a resume, and if you're having trouble like identifying your transferable skills, you know, to go towards a certain job, um, the Career Center is very, very good for that, and and I can vouch for that. All right, we're moving on. Yeah, I think I think we can. Okay. Transferable skills. You heard me talk about it, um, and this is just 
what are they? Um, transferable skills are those universal skills that are, usual, that are useful in virtually any setting and any line of work. And again, that goes back to you, um, you know, college educated people, being able to go back to your, your employment history and even though the jobs, you know, one was a construction worker and now you're going for a position as, a, as an accountant or whatever. I'm just, I'm trying to draw, you know, to under the spectrum here. There are things that, that people might have done as a, as a construction worker that would lend to that accountant's position, believe it or not. The, the challenge for, for that person is to figure out what those skills are and figure out what a typical, you know, person that runs an, an accounting firm, what they want in an accountant. Figure those out, and then you'll figure out what you can pull from your history and how it relates. So again, transferable skills are highly desirable and include the following in these bullets here, communication, uh, attention to detail, flexibility, willingness to learn customer service, and the ability to work well with others as part of a team. All of those skills right there are really, really um, involved in every single job that you could possibly have. Um, if you show me, if you tell me that you're willing to learn, obviously that's a big one for people with not too much work history. If I get a vibe from someone and they have less work experience, um, but they show me in an interview or, or in person that that they're really eager to learn and I really get that vibe from them that they really, really want to do good for me, um, they could easily get hired over someone that has 10 years of experience doing the same job but just kind of, you know, kind of falls flat in an interview and, or has a resume that doesn't back themselves up. Um, so again, these types of skills, you know, you really have to bring them to the table, focus on what you bring to the table and, and, and go with that. But, any, but any, anyway, I, I, these bullets here, again, they, they, they go with any job and these are just kind of generic, but these are ones that you can always fall back on, okay? And again, if you say these types of things or you write these types of things in your resume, you know, if you say that you pay attention to detail but your resume has misspelled words or it's not uniform, um, you know, it's not consistent all the way through the, inter the, the resume, then you've just shown me that you don't pay attention to detail, that you just wrote some words on a paper. So again, all these things are, are there to back you, back, you, back you up and they all have to coincide, your application, your interview, and your resume. How can they strengthen a resume? Okay, the ability to communicate work well with others, manage time, are highly desirable skills to nearly all employers in virtually every line of work. We kind of said that already. To strengthen a resume, okay, identify your transferable skills and clear examples that demonstrate those said skills. What that means is clear examples. When you, when you say something and you do something, okay, you say in an interview, just for instance, in an interview, you say, well, I'm, I'm really, I'm really energetic, you know, it doesn't show me that, you know, that, that's not it. If you say I'm energetic, for instance, you know, on my last job I was consistently looking for things to do, I would always get my work done, I would always, you know, want to do something else, want to learn new things, you know, want to do something different and be in a different setting that I could learn and expand my skills. That sounds a lot better than I'm really energetic, okay? so. Again, this is just saying that whatever you write on your resume has to match up with what you're doing in an interview or in person. And these transferable skills, they have to demonstrate those skills. You have to use specific examples, even in your resume, to strengthen those things. Now, you don't have a lot of room in your resume to give specific examples, but you should have specific examples ready for each bullet point that you put in your resume. If you if using a functional resume, group life skills together. That's just saying that you know if you're using a resume that you don't have a lot of work history, you really want to focus on those skills, keep them consistent, make sure it flows. You know, have somebody read it for you, but make sure your skills are flowing in a in a good in a good order. Use clear and specific examples to demonstrate your skills, but be careful not to make examples too specific, so as to make your skills appear less transferable. Again, if you're on a construction site, I don't want to necessarily know, you know, the ins and outs about, you know, say digging a ditch. I don't need to know that. What I need to know is how you were able to problem solve when you had to dig a ditch and you didn't have a shovel. Okay, something like that. There's a big difference there. So again, 
you really want to just pull things out from your past work history to, um, to lend itself to the new position. And that's the biggest thing. That's your biggest challenge for all of you is pulling out transferable skills. Again, show, don't tell. Um, an example of initiative, provide recommendations to upper management to increase productivity and efficiency without neglecting the client's overall positive experience. That's a bullet point. Okay? That's a skill. Okay? And it doesn't, you don't have to write initiative and then write that. You write that as a bullet point. And that shows initiative. That shows an initiative without you having to write the word initiative. What employer that you know would not want to see that? Okay, if I have a small business or a large business, who would not want to see that bullet point in, in a resume? Thoroughness and attention to detail. Research and gather facts regarding complex questions. Evaluate best course of action and provide accurate answers in response to customer inquiries. All right, again, this is a, this is a great bullet point. That's a bullet point that any employer would love to see on, an, on a resume, obviously, that pertains. So these are things that, th these are ways that you want to write your bullet points, okay? And those of you with those types of experiences, even though the job was 10 years ago or the job was waitressing or being a waiter, that, that, that doesn't matter. What matters is you can do these skills, that you did these skills, that you've attained these skills. Focus on that instead, okay? Any questions that you want to hit, jo uh, Joanne, before we move on? Yeah, there were uh, just a couple really quickly. Um, with regards to cover letters in connection to resumes, are they really read by employers or are they ignored? Um, in some specific um, fields, a cover letter is very acceptable, but that's up to the applicant to figure out if that field is really um, still accepting cover letters. I'll tell you this, um, I don't look at cover letters. Um, to me, they're kind of outdated and, and un unnecessary. Um, that's kind of, I hate to say that, but it's just the way it is now. Um, Cover letters are really, really um, formal, okay? So if you're going for a formal type position in a field in which you know that cover letters are still expected, um, then you should, by all means, complete a cover letter. And it should be good, and it should be in line with what you're saying in your resume. However, if, um, you know, if you're going for a position where you know, it's not really standard practice anymore. Um, I don't, I don't see the point of a, of a cover letter. I don't read them. Uh, I don't look at them. I don't know anybody, um, any one of my peers that that necessarily does. So it really just depends. You know, it depends how formal the position is. It depends how formal the 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 business is, the field. You know, and and that's up to each one of you to to find that out and do your research before you submit a resume or an application. Um, and that's really, again, another challenge for you. But personally, no, I don't, I don't look at cover letters. What kind of references uh, or what, what types of relationships, I guess, uh, make the best references? Business, um, business references always make the best um, references. Um, and again, you know, you want it to be somebody that hopefully you've worked for or with uh, in a professional business setting. Um, just, I'll just say professional references, professional, not even business, just professional references. Someone that you worked with, um, typically you like to have a, a reference of somebody that was, um, you know, that was... Um, that was responsible for you and your work, you know, like a boss or a manager, you know, supervisor, manager, uh, director, something of that sort. You want to have references, professional references, come from from a position, at least a position above where you were in your job. In other words, a lot of people that work for me here, they ask when they're interviewing another position, they ask if they can use me for a reference, and I'll say, yeah, you know, of course. Um, again. We'll talk a little bit about references towards the end, but references are, are very important. If, they ha if, if you don't have three, three to five professional references and you have to use a friend or family member, um, 
you know, just make sure that they don't have the same last name as you. Uh, try to try to make it so they don't have the same last name as you, so it doesn't look so obvious. But you know, eventually the the question is going to come up: How do you know this person? Um, and personal references are fine, but professional references are really what you need. Um, you guys are all college grads or soon to be college grads. It's time to start that networking and get professional references. And you know, even if you've never worked for a professional reference, if you know a family friend or someone like that that's a director or CEO or holds a holds a you know a prestigious position somewhere, you should absolutely ask them if they can use you or if, if you can use them for as a reference for a position. Because believe it or not, employers do look at the position of the person that they're contacting. And you know, people's people's positions usually speak to how much merit they're given in a professional setting. So um, definitely try to keep a professional reference. And as an employer, David, um, because many of our attendees today are current students or are fresh out of college, would you categorize um, past professors as a professional reference that they could refer to? I would. Um, typically, professors are used more so for you know, getting into master's programs or getting into internships, um, things of that nature. But it, sure, I mean, if if you don't have that work experience or those professional references, by all means, you can use um, professors. And it's the same thing I just mentioned about a family friend that might be the CEO of a company. It's the same thing. Um, this person isn't actually a professional reference, but you know, in a way, they've come to learn your work. You know, your work habits. Your they can speak to your work habits probably better than than a buddy of yours can, or you know, your best friend that you've known for 15 years that you've never worked with. So yeah, absolutely. If you if you can't think of other professional references, you can definitely use professors. But you don't want to use all professors. You don't want to have five references and have them all be professors. You know, start to think outside the box. Start to think of different ways that you can attain these professional references because employers do really rely on references. That's one thing I will say. You know, when someone comes from outside of the county, we definitely call their references, minimum of three. So, um, you know, it's very important. But I would say, yeah, if you have to, go ahead. How would you on your resume highlight that you're able to speak another language for example, Spanish, but you wouldn't classify yourself as being fluent enough to be bilingual. If you put bilingual anywhere um, on an application uh, or a resume or say it in an interview, you better be fluent. Um, we've had individuals that have come through that have, you know, because it, it just asks. On our application, it simply asks, do you write, you know, do are you, do you have the ability to speak another language? And then it'll, it'll give a spot where they can put, you know, mark yes or no, and then it'll ask if they can read and write, you know, and speak. So anyhow, the long, the long story short is this. We've had people that write yes, they get hired on as a bilingual type position because that's what we need, and then we send them to get certified, you know, down at Fifth Street, and they can't get certified, so they don't keep their job. So you're doing yourself a disservice if you're not fluent. That's something that you can bring up in an interview maybe. Um, I would save it for then. Uh, if you feel like that's the only way to get an interview is to write that you speak another language or that you can write another language, then you know, you're know you going out on a, on, a, on a kind of a far limb or you're putting yourself out there in a little ways that you don't really want to do. Uh, because if the job is contingent upon that, then you're you're really setting yourself up if you can't pass an actual you know an actual test or something to certify that you are. A lot of places don't certify that. They just okay, you know, this person can can read and write. They don't they don't give bilingual pay. So it's really up to you. My my advice though is if you're not fluent and you don't think that you can that that you are fluent, you're not strong enough to carry on a lengthy conversation about professional type business stuff then I wouldn't mark it. Um, but if you feel like that's something that you want to mark on there, that you want to put on there, that you do speak another language, and then maybe in the interview explain that you're not exactly fluent, but you know, you're not going to say it like that, but if you want to bring that out in an interview, 
then you know, by all means, in interviews too, a lot of times, if the interviewers speak Spanish or, or another language that they need you, they'll they'll do it right then and there. They'll ask you questions in Spanish. If you can't respond, guess what? Okay, thank you. If you want to go ahead and blaze forward. All right. Tailoring a resume, um, again, it just says one size does not fit all. Um, you really want to tailor your resume. You want to start with a generic resume that, that really is like your, you always go back to, that whole, that has basically your essential skills, skills that, you know, always have every, you know, that always speak to what you have or what you can offer. Um, you know, you don't just keep one and keep it up to date. Um, you really want to read the posting, as it says in number two. Read the posting. That's what I was talking about, those transferable skills. What skills do I, well, you know, people ask me, what skills do I put on a resume? What should I put on a resume for a particular particular position. Read the posting. Read the distinguishing characteristics that these employers write in their postings for this position. And each one of those buzzwords or those skills that they write in there should be in your resume. Um, it's really that simple. And you should be able to pull those skills out from your history to apply those that way. Um, again, keywords, desired qualifications, those are the things that you need to look at before you do your resume for this particular position. Again, the people that are lazy, the people that don't really care, that aren't hungry, that really aren't ready, you know, to to put everything forward, they don't they're not they're not the ones that are gonna do these types of things. Okay? You really want the job, you're really hungry, you really want to be assertive, these are the types of things that you do. Read the posting, find out what they want. Number three, read your generic generic resume with a critical eye. Um, again, it's just saying that, you know, the qualifications that they're desiring you should have in your resume. Um, make necessary changes, okay? Um, that's just saying when you, you know, when you uh, save your resume, make sure you, you uh, specify what the different resumes are. Um, that way you don't get them mixed up. And you can always, like, get one, tweak it, make it work for, you know, a similar position. You don't have to create everything from the ground up. That's all it's saying, pretty common sense stuff. Qualifying listed within job posting. That's just saying again, if the if it says the applicant must possess at least two years experience configuring Windows Vista and Windows 7. Okay. A generic and a generic resume might say install and configure operating system software. Okay, a tailored resume or uh, a resume that you guys are all gonna write now will say installed and configured Windows XP, Windows Vista, and Windows 7 professional for all network users. Okay, that tells me more than just saying installed and configured operating system software. Because if you don't address that in an interview or you don't, it doesn't come out of your mouth just that way, you may leave an interview without actually having the chance to actually say those things. Okay, or you may not get an interview because your resume doesn't say what they want. So again, you want to tailor this resume to to go at exactly what they're looking for. And employers make it really easy. They tell you what desired candidates have or what they want. So it's your job to, to figure that out and, and put that in your resume. All right. Most companies require resumes be uploaded online or done an online application. Um, it's just saying here to make sure that you read the employer's instructions carefully, okay? Again, following simple instructions is the quickest way to to disqualify yourself. Okay, and a lot of employers will do these types of things because, again, it's not so much you know what you've done or or, or, or what qualifies you for the job, what disqualifies you for this job, and it makes employers' job easier when you have so many applicants. Really, it's about you disqualifying yourself. So what we're trying to do here, what we're trying to teach you here or show you here today is that the more things, the more out of your way, the more attention you pay to everything that you do, the less chance you have of screening yourself out before you even get that chance to interview or that chance to, to, you know, to show them what you can do. You know what I'm saying? So really, again, you don't want to screen yourself out that way. There's no magic or correct resume length. Your resume should be long enough to clearly demonstrate how well your skill set matches the employer's need. Again, going back, I, I kind of, I, res I, I reside on the side where you, you know, I think it should be one page. But again, 
if the employer really needs to see everything that you've done, all your work history, all your attributes, and everything else, and it's more than one page, and you feel comfortable with more than one page, go with two pages, go with three pages. But remember this, if you're sending out two pages, three pages, you're giving them out, and you're not having success, you may want to think about switching up. Same way with one page. If you're going for a position that requires a lot of, a lot of uh, work history and a lot of skills and a lot of this, then you need to look at maybe, okay, maybe one page isn't working for me. And that's okay. You need to switch it up. If certain things aren't working, don't be afraid to switch it up. There's no one way. There's no one answer. Okay, but, but typically now, just with the way people are with time and, and number of applicants we see, one page is usually the way to go. Many companies utilize screening software to make first round cuts. Again, they'll go through when you submit applications online. And if your resume or application doesn't contain, you know, these these particular words or phrases, um, they won't even look at it. They'll just go with the ones that do. So again, your attention to detail really can dictate how far you get in the hiring process. So pay attention to that. Your contact information should be clear, and at the top of the first page, your name should appear at the top of each subsequent page. Okay, having your name on a resume, I know it sounds ridiculous, but it, it, it really it really needs to, it can't be the same size as everything else. It has to be a little bigger. It has to stand out just a little bit. You don't have to go overboard, but they should know whose resume they're picking up when they pick up your resume. And, um, and make sure if you're doing more than one page, make sure that you're last name is, at least your last name, if not first and, first and last, is on each subsequent page. Your email address, okay, it needs to be professional and appropriate, all right. Um, you really just, you know, you don't want to get overboard. I, I've seen a lot of email addresses where um, it just wasn't appropriate for a professional type setting. Um, that's all cute, you know, when, when you're a teenager and, you know, even in college, you know, these, these unique names that have these different types of things in them. Um, but if it's, if you think it might be offensive in any way, it might turn off an employer for any reason, do yourself a favor and just create a, a different one. Use the Cal State one. Um, create a different one at Hotmail, Gmail, wherever. Just, just create a generic email where you can just put on your job application and that you can get into and check regularly. Okay, I know it sounds silly, but people get disqualified for a lot less. And I'm just saying, I've seen some really, really inappropriate email addresses. All right, be sure to make your resume, be sure your resume is free of all spelling and grammatical errors, grammatical errors, excuse me. Um, Again, common sense, but you'd be surprised, okay? Proofread it, have somebody else proofread it, and then have somebody else proofread it. Um, when you write a resume, when you write a paper, you know what you're trying to say, so oftentimes you'll look past uh, an omitted word um, or a misspelled word because you know what you're trying to say. Obviously, we know this already, so just like you would do with a paper, um, spell check doesn't fix everything. So have somebody else proofread it. This is where the Career Center may come in so handy. Have, go in there, you know, ask somebody from professional, um, you know, advice and just do it that way. Or have, have another professional, you know, do it. The point is just have somebody do it. If submitting a printed resume, be sure to use clean, wrinkle-free resume paper for both your resume and cover letter. And again, your references as well. Um, your paper should be consistent. It should be... Um, it should not be on pink or purple or yellow paper. It shouldn't be anything crazy. It should be on white, you know, uh, bone, uh, gray, you know, stone kind of paper. Um, you can get a little creative with it. It's, it's okay to get creative, but don't go overboard and, you know, I would stay away from color. Um, don't include a photo unless your, your field really, you know, requires the headshot or the, the, the look. If you want to show people, um, if you need to show people what you look like. But other than that, <laughs> don't put your photo on your on your resume. It's really unnecessary. Um, that's one of the quickest ways to get your resume thrown out. Okay. Um, don't include salary history unless it's specified. Uh, that typically doesn't happen. So you really don't want that anywhere near your, your resume. 
that's something that you can um, you can uh, negotiate if if applicable after you've been offered the job. And again, um, don't include the references unless you actually ask to do so on there. Um, and just put that they're available upon request. And again, have those ready at hand. And the last slide uh, before we move on. Uh, consistency is key. As I said, your margins, your margins all need to be the same all the way around. Okay. Um, don't have you know half inch margins on the left and two inch margins on the right. I know that's kind of absurd just when I say it. Um, but you'd be surprised. Make sure all your margins are tight and that everything is consistent all the way down the left side of your paper, the top of your paper, the bottom and the right. Um, and, and, and the writing, the font. Okay? It's okay to bold certain things and it's okay to, to make certain subheadings bigger, but everything else on the right side of the paper should be consistent. Okay? You don't want to get, get cute with you know, bolding certain things, italicizing certain things, um, making certain words or things bigger or underlining, don't do any of that. References must be good. They must be good references. In other words, don't put down a reference that if they're going to call the reference, the reference is going to say, well, you know, I worked with them before, or yeah, I know them, um, but, you know, their work habits are kind of, you know, they're kind of questionable. I mean, obviously that's going to get you disqualified. If you have to use a personal reference, you know, make sure you, Make sure your <laughs> make sure your friend or whoever it is knows that they may be calling, and make sure if you ever go by like a nickname or, or if they know you by a different name, um, you say, "Hey, you know, so and so may be calling, or I'm putting you as a reference. They're going to ask you about, you know, David Kiros. They're not, you know, and if everybody calls me, you know, by a nickname, they call up and ask about David Kiros. They're going to say, "Who?" You know, I don't, I don't know that person. I don't know who that is. Um, so make sure that they understand that they, people could be calling you for references, that they need to give you a good reference. All right. Contact information should be accurate and appropriate. Again, your phone number, I know the ringback tones um, are really popular. Uh, so you really need to uh, make sure that you may want to take those, if you're job searching, you may want to take those ringtones off. Um, I've actually called a person to offer her a position, um, and it was the most ridiculous ringback song. I think it was like uh, um, Nicki Minaj or something. It was something of that sort where it was just the most ridiculous ringback tone that I've ever heard. And I actually, I mean, I considered. I didn't, I didn't withdraw the job, but I considered, and I actually made a mention of it to her. Um, and she was very apologetic, but if I hadn't been so, I don't want to say understanding, but if I hadn't wanted her so badly for the position, it may have you know, disqualified her. Uh, but it happens. It happens a lot. So you may want to take those ring back tones off just as a, you know, as a caution. One page or more, that again, that's just saying, depending on the field, make sure you do one page. You can definitely do more. What does your resume say about you? Your resume needs to be consistent and clean. And it needs to be, it needs to flow, okay? And it needs to be as as tight as you can get it. And practice makes perfect. So you need to do more than one. You need to keep run these by people and keep doing those types of things so that you get the right resume. Paper color, paper color is not always dictated by your preference. And that just goes to say again, watch your color. Um, you know, be. It's not whatever color you think is pretty or whatever color you think looks good to you. Okay, it's the employer. Okay, try to think in the employer's shoes. Be professional. Be conservative. It's okay. You don't want to disqualify yourself because of the color of paper that your resume is on. And then last, more than one resume is essential. Um, not just more than one resume in number. You need to have multiple um, resumes when you go. When you go to an interview, sometimes we have panel interviews. Okay, and more than one person is going to be interviewing you. In that sense, then you need to have more than one resume ready to give them. Okay, so it, you should have at least three. All right, with your if there are cover letters required, with that, with your resume, and then with your references, and you should have those ready to go in an interview when they ask. But you should at least have, you know, three. I would say, and then version. That just means you know you should have multiple versions of resumes that you can. Okay, 
this is my contact information. And, um, you know, as Joanna said, this contact information will be available to you. Um, I'll leave it on this page while we answer some questions. We're running a little bit over, so let's uh, quickly um, answer just a couple of the outstanding questions. And again, we'll happily send all of David's uh, slides to you all via PDF. Um, but just really quickly, David, if the employer asks you for three references, do you still give them five? No. No. That's a good question. Um, only ask what the employer, only give what the employer asks of you. Um, yes, that's, that's absolutely correct. What I meant by having five is always have five available. Um, always have, you know, five there where you, that you can use. If if they don't specify that they only want three, um, if they specify that they only want three, definitely you should only have three on your page, on your reference list. Um, but if they don't specify, um, then you should have five on your reference page, I would think. Um, or if they, if you don't want, if you don't feel comfortable putting five, you should have three minimum, but also have those two, you know, in your head or written down somewhere where you can give them to them if they want four or five or whatever. But no, if they ask for three, give them three. If they ask for one, give them one. And the last question we'll answer via today's uh, live presentation. The others, again, will be answered to email. When you personally have considered successful applicants, did most of them use networking or know someone to get in? Um, how important is networking? Um, I would say when you're when you're in private sector business um, or even nonprofit, um, it's really important. It's extremely, extremely important. Um, which is why I, I see where the university, you know, does so much to try to bring together alumni and and. and graduates and, and future graduates and things like that, um, you know, through Coyote Careers and, and the Alumni Association. But it's so important because um, I would say, oh, man, there's so many jobs that are given every day because somebody knows somebody or because somebody referred them or because somebody knows somebody that might be doing some hiring or, you know, a friend of a friend. It happens all the time. The reason I say it's more important in the private sector is because when it comes to public agencies like County of San Bernardino, Cal State San Bernardino, um, City of San Bernardino, or you know the surrounding all the surrounding areas, you know County of Riverside, whatever. When it comes to these types of places, um, the there's such uh, strict guidelines that we have to follow when when uh, when screening applicants, when accepting applications, and then you know the way it's done. It's just kind of a real long red tape bureaucratic process, um, and that's put in place so that everybody is treated equally and no one's given preferential treatment. So there's so many steps that people have to go through before they even get an interview. And by the time someone gets an interview, you know nobody even knew that they were on that list with that particular um, you know department in that particular city. So that's why it's done that way. It's really hard, you know, to have your networking. Uh, your network help you in, in, a, in a private in a public setting but in a private sector by all means you should increase your network you should start now you should be you know you should be going to separate different functions you should be meeting people you should be doing all you can to to network with people and build those relationships great thank you David and thank you again to all of you who participated in today's webinar um, session again I'll be emailing you um, later on this week, the PDF version of David's PowerPoint. And we'll also post that online on the CSUSB Alumni Association website. As you exit the webinar today, please take just a few moments to answer, I think it's five questions um, regarding your experience here with the webinar so that we can get your feedback and we can um, work to improve our webinar series so that we're meeting the needs of our alumni and our students. Um, that's why we're here and what we hope to do with this. Um, we hope you have found the experience valuable and that you'll continue attending 
our webinars as well as our in-person events. Um, after all, you are in good company. Thank you all so much. <laughs>